Yes, you're lovely. <laughs> Just before I get into my preach, uh, Gemma, where are you? She disappeared. Can't see her. She, she did great. Look, she, she's breaking new ground. Yes, she is. Gemma, that was brilliant. I think you're breaking new ground, girl, and um, I just encourage you to do that. And I want to encourage you a lot, too, because you are on the stage. You might be sitting down there, but you are the choir. And some of us struggle with some of the new songs, you know, the tunes, the different words. That's okay. Listen, learn, because it's important that you engage with this team up here, because you are the team down there. And if you don't feel the love of God, just join in anyway and become one with what God is doing. Because when we are there in a place of unity, uh, this team leading this team, then the Spirit of God comes down. It's so important that we gather on a Sunday. Sunday is not the, the, the whole of our life. It's only a little portion. But it's important that we gather on a Sunday, that we follow the worship leaders, because they are leading us, they are prepared, they are ready, they have prayed up, and I, I'm excited about what can happen. I see this place full of people, just full to the overflowing, and there's just one sound going up. And those who come in here feel the presence of God, not because they're super spiritual or anything, just because there's a oneness here and God is here. God wants to speak to us. Let's have the slideshow up. We're talking on the journey of Pentecost. I've chosen um, a fiery background for my slides today because one, it represents the power and the, the fire of the Holy Spirit, the purifying Holy Spirit. But two, it represents also the, the passion of human hearts, both for good and for evil. And we'll look at some of that later on. Last week, Pastor Bruce talked of some of the uh, appearances or, or visitations of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and made the point that he visited but he wasn't resident, he didn't come to stay. But with the New Testament and the, uh, the coming of Jesus, his death, his resurrection and then the, uh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to fulfill what happened in the book of Acts, what was prophesied in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit came to stay. But before he came, Jesus prophesied. And I'm sure many of you will know this verse where he said in Acts 1 8, the, when, you, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, he will empower you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the ends of the earth. We're going to talk about this because this is a journey that Jesus prophesied. It wasn't just words that he was uttering to his disciples. He prophesied a journey that began back at Pentecost and is still continuing 2,000 years later. We are part of that journey. We are the ones to be empowered to be his witnesses in this world today. It's important that we come here on a Sunday, but equally important is what we do seven days a week out there, impacting our world and carrying the anointing of God and the fire of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus sets out the expectation of this journey to be undertaken as the Holy Spirit empowers his followers. This is the unfinished journey. Our assignment in Aotearoa, New Zealand in 2021 and beyond is part of this journey. Are you on this journey? That's the question I want to pose this morning. Let's have our next slide. We're going to look at some of these stages of the journey. Jerusalem. Ah, oh, Jerusalem. And I'm going to coin a phrase that um, came from Jacinda Ardern in the aftermath of the Christchurch massacre in the mosque. They are us. Jerusalem, in a sense, is a, a safe place for the disciples of the time. It was a city. Um, the various opinions as to the population, the minimal population that was 20,000, about the size of Cambridge. Um, it goes right up to a couple of hundred thousand, the size of North Shore in Auckland. Um, but at this particular time of Pentecost, the population was uh, um, swollen, maybe up to a quarter of a million people. 
uh, to celebrate this Feast of Pentecost. It was a comfortable place, there was known territory, uh, there were visitors from Europe and Africa and Asia, um, all Jews um, and known people. And in a sense, the disciples could look around and say, they are us. We identify with this people. We know this people. We know who they are and we're comfortable with them. We're comfortable in this context. Judea is the surrounding district. It's uh, more rural in nature, countryside, mountains, deserts, and smaller villages. But still, familiar territory that Jesus and his disciples had traversed for three and a half years as he trained them and discipled them. They were familiar and they could say into this place of Judea, yes, we're comfortable with that too. They are us. We know these people. They speak our language. They know our customs. They have the same beliefs as us. Next slide. Samaria. Oh, oh, they are not us. Samaria was people who were left over from the ten tribes of Israel when Israel was split into the south and north kingdoms and eventually taken away in captivity to Assyria and then populated by people from Assyria with mixed uh, marriages, interracial marriages. Um, the Samaritans considered themselves to be the only true representatives of the Kingdom of God and the land of Israel. Uh, and between Judea and Samaria there was a lot of angst, hostility, opposition, uh, not comfortable at all in terms of their relationship, deep racial and religious gaps between the two people, hostility. We see that in some of the parables that Jesus spoke of. He spoke of the parable of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan was not just a goody good going along the road. The remarkable thing about it was that the Samaritan stopped to help a Jew, unheard of. The Samaritans were people that you crossed the road to avoid. You got people like that in your life? You know, people, there's, there's just that hostility that, you know, you don't identify with them. They're not, not your kind of people. More than that, they're your enemies. Somehow there's an alienation in your soul towards them. There's a deep human uh, resistance to, uh, to, to move away from the centre um, into places that we don't know. Where there's this cry in our heart, they're not us. We don't feel comfortable with them. But Jesus said, I'm empowering you to go, to go into those places that are not comfortable. Jesus said, love your enemies to the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth are even further remote. They're not us either. They're people of different skin color. They're people of different religious beliefs. They speak a different language that they're totally foreign to us. And again, we can only remember that Jesus prophesied that the power of the Holy Spirit was sent so that we might go on this journey, even to the ends of the earth, even to people that we don't know, that we don't identify with. Having coffee with somebody on Friday, they said into their church came a guy tattooed up to the hilt and across his head was marked, if you, I won't say the words, how do you handle someone like that? Would he be welcome? Would you go up to him and say, welcome brother? Would you embrace him? Or would we say, he's not one of us? Too much history, the history of the church has been down there. So there are barriers to this journey that Jesus sets us on. That there are distinct difficulties that make us resist moving from the place of comfort and familiarity out into the unknown. And there's that tendency uh, to, to just gravitate back to the center where we're safe. We're safe here, aren't we? <laughs> and this is good. This is good. We need to be here. We need to feel safe. Anybody who comes in here needs to feel safe. But we need to acknowledge that Jesus prophesied us out of here and into the world so that we might touch the world with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's where it's happening. The journey continues 
Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Next slide. Let's have a look at some of these barriers. Firstly, there's the language barrier. They speak a different language to me. I don't understand them. Secondly, there's the barrier of hostility, the people that I cross the road to avoid. Thirdly, the barrier of xenophobia. Can someone tell me what xenophobia is? No one? Fear of strangers. A natural tendency to keep people at bay. You know, when um, uh, so many times missionaries would go into foreign countries um, and they would remain remote from the people because they'd create their own little enclaves, their own little places of shelter and they didn't really touch base with the people because it's very natural to gravitate to our own kind and there's that inherent fear in us of uh, mixing with people that we, where we don't know the language or the customs might be different. Okay, so xenophobia. Racism. We know what racism is. The great last divide that divides us people. But on this unfinished journey, the Holy Spirit begins to demonstrate for us His power to overcome these barriers. His power to break through these barriers. Next slide. He broke through the language barrier. On the day of Pentecost, people were gathered from all over and Jews from the diaspora. Does anybody want to know what a diaspora is? I'm giving you some big words today. Diaspora is the scattering. You know, Jews have been scattered by wars and wars and wars, scattered all over the world. And they were found in Africa, they were found in Asia, they were found in Europe. And they'd all grown up in different cultures. Still Jews though, Jews at heart. And they believed the same as the Jews in Jerusalem, which is why they were in Jerusalem, because they'd come back for the Feast of Pentecost. But they came back with their different languages, their different customs, their different everything, except the same belief in the need to gather in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And as the Spirit of God came down on those early disciples, they spilled out onto the streets, and there was a hue and cry, and people came from afar, and they said this, we're amazed because we're hearing them speak in our own language. These are unlearned men from Galilee, and yet we're hearing them speak in our own language. Oh yes, I love that. God broke through the language barrier. Oh, language is so important. He speaks to people in their heart language. For those of you who are a little bit uncertain, God is not old, white, and English speaking. <laughs> he speaks to you in your heart language. He loves you. And I, I rejoice always in that passage in Revelation where we see the end party, all nations and tribes and people standing before the God, God of the ages and glorifying God in their own tongues. Language is so important. Wade Davis, philanthropist, is avidly keen about languages. He comments that languages are disappearing from this earth faster than species. Old people are dying off as the last um, um, people who know their languages. Dialects all over the world. There are thousands upon thousands of them and they're so important because they speak to the heart. The Holy Spirit broke through that. The history of colonialism is one of eradicating languages. In our own land, Maori, the Tereo, nearly became extinct. And I thank God for its revival because it's so important to what God wants to do in this land. All over the world, languages have been forbidden in classrooms uh, by native speakers. But that's not on God's agenda. He's not all white and English speaking. He is your person. You might say, they are us. 
Next slide. Hostility. Acts chapter 8, I think it is, or 10. Um, we see the story of Philip the Evangelist. God directed him to go down to Gaza. Gaza Strip, where there's so much dramatic stuff happening at the moment. So much pain and agony and hostility. And he went down there and he met an Ethiopian eunuch. Anybody know what a eunuch is? Yeah, that's right, one who's been castrated. He was a courtier in the royal queen's uh, household. And probably castrated so he'd be, um, the queen would be absolutely safe and her maidens would be absolutely safe. But here's this brown boy from Judea going down to meet a black man from a royal household. Um, there's, there's a crossing of barriers here. Um, but he, um, we'll, we'll get onto that a little bit later. Um, but firstly, he, he goes into a city in Samaria. Philip goes into a city of Samaria and he begins to preach the gospel and the people receive it. Here's a Jew from Judea going into enemy territory, crossing the boundaries, and the Holy Spirit is with them, and as he preaches the Gospels, they receive it. And it says all who heard it were baptized, and there was great joy in that city. So the Holy Spirit breaches another barrier of hostility. Jesus breached these barriers too. Remember um, the story of the Good Samaritan which I recounted briefly before. But also when he went into Samaria himself, he sat at a well in the heat of the noonday sun, and a woman from that place came to draw water from the well, and he began a conversation with her, and her first words were, why are you talking to me? I'm a Samaritan, you're a Jew. We don't talk. You're not us. We're not you. There was that hostility, that alienation, but Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit pushed through that barrier. Barriers of hostility can easily be pushed through. Let's go to the next phase. Next, uh, your magic word, what does it mean again? Fear of strangers. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Good man, Isaac. Just keeping you on your toes. The Holy Spirit had started to, to push out beyond the limited worldview that the disciples held. We're Jews. We're comfortable with our own people. They are us. He pushed out um, beyond the language barrier. He pushed out beyond the hostility barrier, going to Samaritans. They're not us. But wait a minute, they are us because the same Spirit of God comes on them. The same Jesus ministers into their heart speaking their heart language and bringing them to himself. But still the Jews are basically ensconced in this little world of Judaism. And Peter's up on the roof one day praying, very spiritual, or sleeping, very spiritual. And he has a dream, the dream of the unclean foods being lowered down from heaven and the voice saying, Peter, take them, eat them. And Peter's saying, no, 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 no. This is not kosher. Lord, you've given us rules and, and regulations about what we can and cannot eat as followers of Yahweh. And he's stuck in this little mindset. The dream comes again. Peter, take it, eat it. Lord, I can't. It's against my religion. I haven't done that before. This is not me. And again, the dream comes. And finally, Peter begins to discern that this is not just a nightmare because he had too much coffee or toasted sandwiches for dinner. This is God speaking to him. This is God saying, Peter, we're pushing through some barriers here. I thank God for Cornelius, a centurion in the Italian regiment, um, down the coastline from where Peter was. Peter and his team went down there, they met with Cornelius, and as Peter preached the gospel and showed that this Jesus who was crucified is the one who has come to 
bring salvation to the world. This is as they speak. As, as Peter spoke, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the message. And Peter marveled. You know, this, this, is, this is God breaching a barrier. We've not gone there before. We've not associated with Gentiles. They've been unclean. They've been the infidel. They've been the heathen. But God is calling us now to engage with those. And I see that God is no respecter of persons. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. And again, the Holy Spirit demonstrates that the gospel must cross ethnic boundaries, go beyond social status, go beyond religious belief. Let's go to racism. Next slide. And this is, uh, I was jumping the gun a little bit, but uh, this is where brown meets black. Someone of a different skin color. I've got a PNG friend, Papua New Guinea. She studied for some time in Christchurch. She said that she'd never go back to Christchurch. Just walking down the street, she'd get abused because of her skin color. Told to go home. Racism is alive and well in New Zealand. I used to believe that New Zealand was God's own country, just peaceful, serene, harmony everywhere. God's opened my eyes. Racism is alive and well in New Zealand. We have a history, a very tragic and sad history actually. Back in the uh, mid to latter part of the 19th century, gold was discovered down in Otago in central uh, South Island there. And people began to flock to the gold fields. Uh, a lot of the people who came were Chinese. They'd been uh, involved in, in um, mining over in California and places, immigrated around the world, and they came in their droves to good old Aotearoa, New Zealand. And there was a, a huge outcry against them. You can read it in history books. Our history with the Chinese people has been atrocious. We legislated against them. They had to pay a hundred dollar fee for entry. Now that's like paying, I don't know what, 10,000 or 20,000 or whatever it is in today's money. Impossible for them. There were um, marches and uh, parades. There were actually chapters set up that were uh, propagating uh, th that the, the Chinese go home. We're not racially, racially pure. There's all sorts of stuff. So it is with all the colonized countries of the world. You go to South Africa, apartheid was based on biblical belief. Race against race. The walls have come down now, but racism still heart, still lodges in the hearts of men and women. It's a burning, rabid, flaming fire. And you awaken it, and all sorts of things happen. Go back to where you belong. Trump rhetoric. The anti maori legislation that came in the violations of our treaty. Uh, uh, legislation after legislation after legislation that was anti maori Look at it. Think of the injustice. Think of the racism. You go to places like America. America was the, the, the uh, first peoples had inhabited America for hundreds of years. Columbus came across he committed all sorts of atrocities, uh, virtue and genocide. Um, their capital city is called the District of Columbia, the District of Columbus, named after someone who doesn't deserve that honor. The Americans came and the, the Pilgrim Fathers came to America from persecution in Europe. And they came with this fundamental religious belief that theirs was the manifest destiny, destiny, that America was their destiny. I'm getting tangled up with words here. Their destiny. They believed that in their hearts. 
They believed that the people who already occupied the, that, that place were savages, were um, ignorant people, and that they just needed to be got rid of. And, and there's a quote from one of their generals, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. What tragedy. Is this in God's heart? No, it's not. We look at the current tragedies happening in the Gaza Strip, Arab versus Jew. And even outside of the Gaza Strip, in Jerusalem itself, where Arabs and Jews have lived side by side in harmony for a number of years, uprising, violence, and a, a deep, deep hatred. This is a huge barrier. George Lloyd, Lord George say, Black Lives Matter. We see the sy systemic police bias towards black Afro-Americans. I've got a niece in, um, in the Maryland area. Uh, she married a, uh, an Afro-American guy and uh, her son now is a strapping 16, 17 year old and of course, he's, he's brown coloured, uh, mixed race. And my niece is afraid to let him go walking down the street. He's a very mild man. He's not going to do anything unlawful. But he's afraid to step out onto the streets because of the, the bias, the systemic bias of racism that is in that country. We can go back even further to the uh, slave system. Why do I mention these things? Because God is passionate about these things. This is the journey that Jesus prophesied on us. He said, you go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. He said, I'm going to empower you with the Holy Spirit. You'll breach the barriers. You'll pull down the strongholds. You'll deal with the injustices. This is the redemptive hand of God at work. We rejoice when one sinner is saved. Glory. And, and that's good. But it's just a first step in a thousand mile journey. Because God does not stop here. We want the Holy Spirit to come. We want to feel his presence. We want the, the anointing of God to come in this place. And that's good. It's desirable. But it doesn't stop here because when his anointing comes upon us, he empowers us to go, to cross the boundaries, to dare to meet that neighbour who might come from Afghanistan, to dare to converse with that lady who might be a Muslim. I've got a couple of Indian friends in my former place of employment. One was a Sikh. He's um, received news that his mum and two brothers have passed away with COVID. I love that guy. And I was able just to talk to him one to one, human to human. And hopefully something of God transmits in that. I have another one, Hindu. His dad died perhaps three or four months ago. He shaved his head as his custom for, and uh, fasted for 10 days. His dad was uh, a high official and had a funeral of some thousands of people. He just received word that his brother has died too. But I can speak to him at a heart-to-heart -heart level because I've crossed that barrier. I'm not afraid to talk to a Hindu. I'm not afraid to talk to a Muslim. Muslims are not our enemy. They are. God's people waiting for a revelation of the truth. Church is not our place of refuge and safety where we stay confined. These are us. And we are comfortable with this kind of people. It's a place where the Spirit of God empowers us and embraces us and tells us again and again, it's out there, folks. It's out there where you'll cross the boundaries, where you'll challenge the borders, where you'll bring down the strongholds, where you'll deal with the things that are not only overseas, but here in New Zealand. 
we have a task to do. God's plan of redemption not only goes wide, but it goes deep. Some commentators have said that the book of Acts should be entitled the book of the whole, the Acts of, I'm sorry, it's called the Acts of the Apostles. Some commentators have said it should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. I disagree because the Holy Spirit gave us the power. He gave the power to us. Some missionaries have said, uh, missiologists have said that once every nation and every tribe has a gospel uh, representation in their midst, then the task is done. I disagree entirely because the task not only has to go wide, it has to go, go deep. South Africa is a classic. Uh, Reinhard Bonke, the great German evangelist, spread right through that nation, mostly sub-Sahara, and, and not touching the Muslim people so much, but right through the tribal Africa. Millions upon millions upon millions of people saved. But it's only skin deep because nothing has changed the tribal rivalries, the injustices, the deep fire in men and women's hearts. It causes hostility, uh, division, corruptness. See, the gospel's got to go deep as well as wide. It's got to go deep in us. We cannot afford to just come on Sunday, happy clappy, uh, feed me pasta, I'm going away until next Sunday. We need to come and as one engage with what the Holy Spirit is saying and doing. Follow that worship leader with all your heart. You don't know the words, tough, sing along, hum along. Do something. Get engaged with it. Because here is where God speaks to us and empowers us again and again and again. And then we go out there and we carry something of that mandate. This is what Pentecost is about. It's not a comfortable feeling when God touches our soul in the midst of worship. Yes, that happens. But it happens for a reason. Jesus prophesied the journey. The journey continues. Have we got that last slide? Oh, in our tiro, crossing boundaries, dealing with xenophobia, confronting racism, facing injustice. There are all sorts of isms that we can deal with uh, that need to be dealt with as the Spirit of God goes deep into our society and touches the ills that are found there. What's our vision statement? Making people passionate about Jesus and equipping them to go and change the world. That's Jesus' mission statement too. He said, I'm going to empower you to go from where you're comfortable to where you're less comfortable for, to where you're very uncomfortable because I want to go deep into this world. I want to see, heal, heal the ills of this world. The Holy Spirit is not just given for a moment in time. It's given for a journey, a lifetime, a commitment. My question to you today as I conclude are you on that journey yet? Are you on that journey? Because you need to be. If you're a follower of Jesus, whether you're just coming to Jesus, whether you've been walking with Jesus for 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, you need to be on this journey from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to change the ends of the earth and to allow the Holy Spirit through you to go deep into your place of influence. Your family, your work, your school, whatever it might be. Let's just pray. Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, what do it happen? It is only you and the work that you're trying to do in our stubborn hearts and through our stubborn lives. Lord, we want to be part of your kingdom. We want to partner with you. Lord, give us the courage to stand up and say, yes, I will face hostility and push through it. Yes, I will go to places that are strange and I will push through my own fears and uncertainties. Yes, I will look at injustice and I will address it with all of my strength and with all of my heart and with the empowerment of your spirit in my life. Father, 
help us as we commit to that journey, that ongoing 2,000 year old journey that continues in our land and beyond. In Jesus' name.